Good afternoon and welcome to the Pervasive Media Studio Lunchtime Talk. So these talks are live every Friday at 1pm or 105 sometimes, uh, both here in the building and live online. So whether you're in Bristol here or far away, out there, out there on the internet, you can join in the conversation. Uh, my name is Martin O'Leary, I am the studio's creative technologist. I'm a white man in my quite late 30s at this stage with uh, long brown hair and a beard, a little bit bald on top. Uh, and every Friday we throw open the doors to the Pervasive Media Studio for what we call Open Studio Friday. This is your chance to come and spend some time in the space, hot desking alongside our residents and staff from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. So an especially big welcome to those of you who are new to the studio. Can anyone who's new to the studio put their hand up? Oh, loads. Welcome. This is great. Uh, you are all very welcome to be here. Um, so what is the Pervasive Media Studio for all of you? Uh, we're a diverse and collaborative community exploring creativity and technology. Everything from comedy to coding and product development to performance art, which is a phrase I have said like <laughs> at least 100 times by now and it never gets old. Uh, we're a partnership between Watershed, the University of the West of England and the University of Bristol. Um, and we offer studio space, desk space, meeting rooms, events and opportunities, all for free for our residents as part of a spirit of generosity and mutual exchange. And most of all, we're a space for people to take risks with embryonic ideas and to make room for collaboration. Uh, now, quick bit of housekeeping, uh, feel free to move around. We're fairly chill, relaxed around here. Make a cup of tea, uh, grab a glass of water from the kitchen. Please don't use the microwave, it interferes with the induction loop and stuff. So. Um, we have a quiet space just through this wall, just around the corner. So uh, if you need to take a break at any point, just head on in there. No need to ask permission or anything. There are fire exits at either end of the studio on that side. Uh, there is not a fire drill planned. If you hear a fire alarm, that is real. Uh, the studio team will direct you towards the fire exits. Um, and accessible toilets and baby change can be found, and just regular toilets as well, uh, can be found in the corridor next to the kitchen. Uh, there'll be a Q&A at the end of this talk. So for those of you in, who are watching online, you can pop your questions into the YouTube chat. For the rest of you, you can stick your hand in the air the old fashioned way. We've got a microphone, we'll come round. Um, you can get news on all of our future talks by heading to watershed.co.uk forward slash studio, at PM Studio UK on Twitter, or at Pervasive Media Studio on Instagram. And before I start, I do want to let everyone know there is no talk next week. Uh, we've got an event on called Hopeful Futures. You are more than welcome to come if you've already got a ticket because it is sold out. Uh, but we'll be back in two weeks time when the SOMA team will be talking about their uh, work designing inclusive VR experiences. So now I would like to introduce our speaker for today. Lucia Cipollina Kuhn is a PhD student at the University of Bristol, specializing in artificial intelligence and art restoration. She's going to be talking about the latest advances in AI applied to artistic media and her work using AI to restore paintings from Escher and Cezanne and the famous Ece Homa from Borja. So uh, take it away, Lucia. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for coming and lending me this space. I will be giving a talk that will be about 30, 40 minutes and then I will leave at the end, I will leave 20 minutes for questions because this topic is so vast and everyone has its own interest that I think it will be good. Is my mic working? Yeah. Fine? Yeah, good. Excellent. So, yeah, I will be speaking about new trends in generative art. So, first of all, what is generative art and what is different between generative art and other technologies? So, generative art, here we have the very first example my latest automation and then something more recent. With generative art, um, you basically use an algorithm. It doesn't have to be a machine, it can be an algorithm with, that with minimal directives, it will produce a piece of artwork that it will be kind of more, that's the fact of using artificial intelligence into it. You can think about the difference between you using your iPad to draw something that wouldn't be generative art, that would be you as an artist using the iPad as a medium. While here, the focus and the center is on the machine. And then what's the algorithm behind the machine that we will cover today a little bit. And then basically it's a combined input between the machine's intelligence or 
then how it interprets your commands and yourself. So it's a blended artwork if we want. It's a step forward for technology and you can say it's also like assisted technology or a medium to assist painters or, or artists. So now um, it's a new era for AI and you see it has been booming, especially in this year. And there's a new trend that it will continue further. And when we talk about art, it's not only for art or pop art, but it's also for other artistic mediums that you can use generative tool sets. I will just show you two examples of things that are generated completely with AI. I want to show you this, and then later I'll tell you the story. What we have seen here was completely generated by an algorithm. The directives were given as text prompts. So basically, the input is a script, and then everything else is imagined by the machine, by the algorithm. Uh, the interesting part about this is that this was crowdsourced. This is a Twitter account that is called Salt, that you can go and then you submit um, whatever you want this story to go, as a, just as text. And then what the algorithm does is the fusion between text and images. So it hallucinates, based on the text prompt, it hallucinates images. And this is um, another artistic medium. This is video. Now I will show you another thing uh, that it was also generated with AI. That it's the next slide. This is a dialogue over an image. So here is the reverse. I input a, an image, this Einstein, and then I start prompting the algorithm for, can you describe this image to me? So this is reverse. I give you the image, and I want the text back. Um, as you can see, what I want here to, to tell you is that it is minimal impact, and the algorithms are able to then produce something new. So here you will see my interaction with the, with the algorithm. Um, if this is too small, I am asking who is in this picture. And then it's Albert Einstein, the response. So I'll try to maybe, maybe more quality. That's a little bit better, no? So who is in this picture? And then the other prompt is a little bit about the colors. Uh, which colors are there? And then the answer is black and white. And then I go a little bit further and try to see if the algorithm is able to understand emotion. So I ask if it's sad, and then the answer is no. So, so that, that is a little bit tricky. That was a tricky question. But then also what I want to convey is that here, there's a fusion of many senses together. Images, text, as we saw, um, sound as well. So this is what we call multimodality. That it's not only generative art. It's also many modalities of mediums fused together. So I wanted to show you what we call, what do we mean by multimodality. So basically it's the fusion of something, an algorithm that, I, that it can understand text, voice, and image, and then go from one to the other. That means I can give you a text and you can either generate voice, this is known at the moment, 
Um, but what it's new is I can give you text, just a description of an image, and then the algorithm will generate an image. So the difference is that what is new here that came most prominently this year is that the image is generated from scratch. So this is not a retrieval system like Google Images that you just describe Paris and then it will come back with an image of Paris that it has on a database. This is completely generated something that didn't exist before. So for example, if I pass you the text prompt, a dog with a tennis ball swimming in murky water, you see that it has generated exactly what you meant. And what is more stunning from that study this year is that it looks real. So this is an advancement that happened actually this year that what it generates, it's pretty good. You see the symmetry in the eyes of the dog. It looks like a dog. This looks like a ball. Um, there is not a lot of pixelation. So it's this fusion of I give you text, you generate an image. I give you an image, you generate the descriptive text. And then with voice and other mediums fused together. So this is what we call the multimodality. And it's what allows us to, with minimal description, have the artwork that you saw. And then I'll explain you a little bit how, I'll give you an overview of how this works. Uh, or what is the principle behind these algorithms. And you will see that then you see, oh, OK, it's not that magic. It's actually something that makes sense. And it has some intuitive reasoning. So I will train you, and you will be my machine. The only thing that I ask you is that you please ha have, need to have infinite memory. So let's make an effort. <laughs> <laughs> if you can have, if you can have a machine that, ah, sorry, yeah, okay. So I'll pass you two things. I will give you the text, dog. You will remember that text, text is a prompt, and you will remember the image. So I am training you in two things, same as you will educate a kid. Um, you just say, oh, look, that's a dog, and then the kid will understand the image and the text, or the description. Now, I will convince you that this blurred image, it's also a dog. OK? And you are, you are retaining that with your infinite uh, memory. This, you still agree with me that it's still a dog. So you are capturing everything in memory. For now, it makes sense. This, uh, you, I can argue, but it seems like a dog, right? This is also a dog. Now, believe me, this is still a dog. And how do we know that this is a dog? Because you also have seen the process of blurring. So every time I'm blurring more and more, it kind of makes sense to you because you have very fresh what you have seen before. So then, this is just white noise. Now, what do we do with this? Now that I have teach you, how a dog looks like and how the blurred image of a dog looks like as opposed to pure white noise, then we can go back and forth. So if I give you white noise and I tell you, can you produce a dog? You will say, ah, OK, let's start from white noise. Let's start adding pixels. So I will start adding little by little, adding pixels until I get the image of a dog. So it's a process. It's not like just one shot. But the idea is that I'll give you a black, uh, white canvas, completely blank, and I'll give you the caption. And then you start slowly recovering how to go from completely random noise, adding the pixels until you get the picture. And if I give you any of these pictures, you will remember that the caption is dog. So if I give you this picture and tell you describe for me, you will remember the pair and you will say dog. And that's a little bit how it works. It's like associating images. I have trained you to associate images with text. So I give you text, you come back with the image. I give you the image, you come back with the text because you have infinite memory. And that's a little bit what we do. Um, the takeaway is just to go from 
white noise <coughs> and a caption. So the input is just the caption, or it can be a longer description. And the output will be a completely new generated image. The thing is that if I have trained you with dog and then, for example, park, then you will fuse those together and you will generate a dog in a park. The magic of this, or the interesting part, is that you can generate images that you have never seen before because you fuse together two things. The, the algorithm is able to fuse as many separate things and blend all together. And this is a little bit how it works, uh, how the algorithm works. And then now I will show you my application that it's, I use this for art restoration. Um, so basically the takeaway for now is that we have an algorithm that we have been trained that with minimal information, it's able to generate new things and with minimal input. So people like me, for example, you can be an artist. Uh, because anyone who knows how to write will be at least able to use this medium to generate something. And then, of course, the matter is, the question is, how do we evaluate the content? And this is one question that we have in art restoration. In art restoration, you want to restore a piece to make it look as if it were real. So not everything will actually work. So. That's the challenge that we have, and that this is where I use um, this is where I use the the algorithms that I told you. So, for example, one thing that we have worked on is Borja's Eche Oma. Uh, some of you may remember this. This is a fresco that was painted in 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 a church, in the wall of a church, and the state of the art is this. <laughs> and you know, in in engineer, we want always to be better than the state of the art. Um, so this was not a difficult task. And so given this, we produced this one, that at least it looks a little bit better. And the fact is that I did this myself. Like You don't need to know a lot about art history or the colors. It's just me and the algorithm with minimal description. A man with a beard, with beard and, and something very minimal, and hair, just that, like whatever you want to produce. And then I didn't put any prompt or any indication for this part because it's just continuing the pattern. So he was able to generate the beard, the hair. It's a little bit confused, but you know, it's still a little bit better, I think. And if we all agree that this is better, the next question is, how do we evaluate? that a restoration meets a certain criteria. And this is also one question that I answer with my research. Basically, I didn't want to give a restorer, this is their restoration. I want to give a restorer tools. So you will have you know, a bag of tools with some science behind it. So you would say, well, this might be better than the other because of this and this and this. And, and you know, in a more scientific base to to make a restoration. Another example that we have work, some of you may know, uh, this is MC Escher's uh, lithography called Print Gallery. Um, this piece has been worked on it for decades, at least from 20 years ago, there have been many attempts not to restore it um, because it's not damaged, it was just left like this, it was left blank. And this is much more difficult than the Eche Omo because you have a structure in the painting. So it's not just colors. The, um, the lithography has like a circular effect and everything in the center, it's very small. So someone like me comes and wants to add something in the center and you see how it's very small and twisted. So I would say, well, this might be a good use case for AI because it's very challenging if we want to complete the center. It would be very challenging to, to know first what's in there, what will be the degree of rotation, and then what can we put in the center that makes sense with the rest of the artwork. So given the original, our research question is, 
how we generate content that can plausibly be in the center and then how do we evaluate it? This is one possibility. This is another possibility. <laughs> These were generated by DALI. And there's a software by OpenAI. And you can see it just generated something very randomly. And, but still, beyond the, the visual effect, we want something that we can evaluate what is better than, than other possibilities. A little bit about print gallery, which is something that we studied for two, three years, is that print gallery has a structure that you see here in this video. You will see this is Malta. It's a place that exists. Some of this is fictitious. You see here a man looking at a painting. We zoom in. And then we break and we give it the twist. This twist has been studied and is parameterized. There are people who spend many years studying how to parameterize this twist. So the challenge is that the, this lithography has a mathematical structure that needs to be, that, that is a constraint and needs to be respected. Because not everything, not every content or not every spiraling can go. It has to be exactly respecting the mathematical pattern behind the painting. I'll show you, once it's finished, I'll show you more about to understand the mathematical pattern behind print gallery. And you see how the inner world he's looking at comes out and then it, it clicks with the world he's in. So he's basically looking at something and then this something pours out and clicks. So let's do one, another one. This is something that you will see uh, sometimes refer when people talk about Escher Print Gallery. Um, that is called the Drost effect. Um, in math, it will be an homothesis, something that repeats itself. Um, in art, you can call it, oh, okay, it's like the, the Drost pact. This is a cacao, um, just a cacao box that you see a nun that is holding a tray with the nun. So it's a self-repeating pattern. Um, some people may think about Mandelbrot as well, but it's just having something that within itself it's repeating. And this is the basics of what's going on in print gallery. And here you see the rotation and the self-repetition that, that the painting has. How do we know the rotation? Because Escher himself left this grid. So this grid, this grid here that you see that explains the, the pattern of rotation was left by Esh. Otherwise, it will be very, very hard. You would just need to try many things and see what works. And then you see how print gallery turns in itself and then repeats itself, just twisted and rotated. I have another one for you. Here you see another angle of print gallery, but what we have done here is we have unraveled the twisting. So I'm going to make a mathematical proof, very precise here, um, very rigorous. So if this is print gallery, what we have done is just this, you just put it straight. So and this is what you're seeing there, just unraveling all the spiral. And you see that because print gallery repeats itself, you see exactly the same thing. It's a little bit like magic, but we didn't do anything. It's not that we made a zoom in. It just, as you unravel something that's repeated, repeating itself, you just see it over and over and over. The, the white patch in the center becomes the spiral that you see. Because a circle, when you unravel it, it just becomes like a spiral. And this is the, the white part that we fill in. So how we are with time? Oh, very good. This is the sequence. You see the man there, and then coming bigger and bigger, like zooming in and in and in. This is just Escher Spring Gallery. This is the, his signature, and, and the, because it's the lithography, he put the number. He numbered all the copies. Um, and this is exactly how you see Spring Gallery once you, you unravel it. And, and now the task was just to, to complete 
with something that makes sense, how would Escher would have completed it? There is a very good book that is called Escher, Godel, and some, someone else, the, the Infinite Triad, <laughs> Bach, Escher, Godel, I think, yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you. It says, that, that book, it says that Queen Gallery wouldn't have been completed because there is no way to complete it. That, that, there's a very famous book, I think, from the 70s or 60s. It's, it's an old book that was before all this uh, revolution. So 10 years ago, someone parameterized the, the spiral so we could do the trick of recovering the straight. And once you have Pringali straight, that you see that it's easier now to complete. Like, I can come and more or less paint what's in here. But probably a painter would, would do it much better. And then once you complete this, you unravel, you twist it again, right? So basically that, that's, that's what we did. So if you have something twisted, we untwisted it. Now you complete it straight because you see it's much easier and then you twist it back. Let's see how we did it. And here I'll show you two examples. It doesn't look perfect, but it looks much better if I had done it. Um, and so the prompt here to complete this was just a man looking at a window. Nothing super crazy, um, but it's just completing exactly the pixelation or, or what it's missing there. And let me show you another one that it's even more stunning. Again, here was the prompt was something like a man in a gallery, and then you see how the algorithm produced a painting that it was not there. It just because, and, and this, this is the, the frame of the window, actually. And even, even though this painting is difficult, what we have here is that there is a pattern that repeats. So it just repeated a little bit the pattern. It repeated very well the colors. And because this, this is, it doesn't know that it's a painting, right? It's just square, white square, white square. And it repeated it very well, the pattern. So we completed all the patches that come from print gallery one by one. Here you see another one. This is the original left by Escher. And this is our completion. And so, so the algorithm produced all this. And you can see that the gallery is not bad. It then repeat the, this is the fence. So the columns, I think it did pretty good job. And then now we're going to unravel it back. Ah, OK. So this is the, the, the same sequence that you saw, but with the completion. And now we're going to twist it all back, and it looks like this. So this is print gallery completed. It has been 16 years since uh, Escher did the lithography. So it looks like this. And then we propose a completion like this that, A, it respects the twisting, because we just untwist and then twist it back. And then it, it fuses very well with the content. And for a restoration, the only thing that we had to do is just touch the center. Um, so we didn't, that's why they look very similar, because it's the same thing. We didn't have to touch any of the other parts. We just work with what was missing at the center. And that's what you want for a restoration, to just um, make an intervention wherever it's needed and without having to redo everything else. This is a zoom of the center. Now I am looking the way you're looking. If you twist your head to the right, like I am doing, you see the man here. So you need to twist your head to the right and put it in your right shoulder. That's the trick to see the man here. This is the head. This is the shoulder here, the arm. And uh, you can see the buildings here. This is a man generated by the algorithm. Uh, the fence that we saw. So this is exactly print gallery up to here. It's print gallery repeated in the center. So then you can see the Droste effect of print gallery. And this is how we know that the restoration is correct, because it respects the pattern that already came with the painting. OK. And 
Yeah, one more time. There's another restore paintings. I want to show you other works that we have restored and then talk a little bit how we assess the, the restoration. This was a difficult one. This is a cubist a Uruguayan author. That's where I am from. This was burned um, in a museum that the museum got burned and, and then the, the piece burned as well. And it's difficult because what prompt do you use? Squares of some sort, <laughs> machine do the rest. Uh, and also, it's also difficult because what the algorithms tend to do is continue the pattern. That's the first thing they attempt. If whether there is a pattern, they will try to continue. However, we don't want to continue the burn part, right? Because the first attempt that the machine will do is to say, oh, black. OK, let me continue the black for you. But it's actually no, because that's the part that was burned. So, so that's a little bit um, where we decided to say, OK, this will be the best restoration possible, just to cut the part that was burned without doing a, you can also do a decoloration or just decolorate this part. But we, we didn't want to touch it. Just we want to restore whatever was already left. Um, this is not an actual restoration. This is a proposal for a restoration. And then for this, to get the prompt is basically the artistry that you have to know exactly how to guide the, the algorithm, to tell the algorithm what you want. And one of the things that you can do is try, but also we did crowdsourcing. So you can ask community of artists, what do you think it would be a good prompt that will go, or, or how would you describe this painting? And also what works is to mention to the algorithm in the style of. That's a very common pattern for prompting. I think this was Paul Klee that I used. So you can say, oh, in the style of uh, Paul Klee. And then it produced things that more or less pretty well follows the pattern and then and then when, when the painting becomes really difficult, OK, just cut and put a frame. And then I show you a last one. And then we can go to questions. I think we're on time. This is uh, the sand that he left uh, unfinished. This is the original. This is not color. It's the cardboard. And it's just the cardboard that it's, this is a piece called Turning Road that he just left unfinished. Probably he didn't see any potential. We don't know. And the problem that you have here is that you don't have any object, really, to describe. Like, if you say, well, a village, it would not do. Um, and also, Cezanne had a very unique palette of colors. It needs to look sad. So, so basically, here, the prompt was a little bit playing about, around with the church. And also, then, choosing the right palette of colors. Uh, one thing that you can do to the algorithm is also show the sun. And when you train the algorithm, as, as, I, as I train you, you can also show, well, this is how the sun or the school of the sun looks. And then it will generate something that at least it will match the content. But mostly what's more important in the case of the sun was to, to follow the palette of colors that he will have used. And you see, every piece of every artwork has its own challenge. Uh, but basically, what we want is um, if someone who knows the sun sees the restored piece, if we want it to pass as a real sun, like someone who's fairly a connoisseur, maybe not too much fan of the sun because this is a known uh, piece that he left unfinished, but someone who's fairly well seen art, it will tell you. Yeah, this could be by Cezanne. And this is also one study that we did, like for the Escher part. We ask uh, people, like, how much of an Escher connoisseur you are? And then do you think this will, could have been done by Escher itself? And then that's one way by using people um, that we evaluate our restorations. And yeah, this is, uh, if you like our work, you can follow us on Twitter and on Instagram. We have the same. Uh, and we have a website that is still in, under completion. Um, yeah, I think I would be happy to take, to take your questions.
looks like we've got plenty of time for questions. Are there any questions in the room? Oh, yeah, we're going. All right, we have a microphone. You need to hold it up to your mouth for it to work. Sometimes people don't realize that. <laughs> Can I have some water? I'll tell you. Thank you. Go for it. Well, I'll ask a question anyway. Yes, um, yes. So with the Torres Garcia piece, that you had, which yes. obviously had the burn damage on it, could you not train the algorithm to understand what burn damage on a similar textile or fabric or whatever it's printed on looks like and then get it to kind of understand if that's what burning looks like, then can we then de what yeah. remove it? That, yes. Would that be possible, do you think, Ethan? It is possible because, thank you so much. Basically, whenever you have a pattern, um, in the case of burning things, it will be just like manipulate the RGB, just the pixels, manipulate the pixels, so add color. And then it will probably, if we go back, it, well, this is something that you can do in Photoshop, like pick. The, the colors from an area and then recolorize, but we want a minimal intervention. But you can train the algorithm to say, well, I, would, I can show you that this is burned and then, and then they can probably decolorize. That's something that we didn't try. Um, yes, but you can probably specifically show how to decolorize something and, and but it will have to take the color from some somewhere else yes but something they can do yeah yeah, yeah. Over here. thanks um so i get the bit about generating new images from scratch you know yes. basically starting with random noise and just creating it when it comes to the restoration though i'm i'm lost how you use that principle of of generating from from noise to know which bit to complete how do you teach it hmm. where the gap is or you know, so I mean, the actual one if you've got the piece in the middle, the, yeah. the studio. But with that, what's to stop it just going kind of too far? You know, where do you, how do you give it the boundaries of I want you to generate this bit of this existing image, kind of? Yes, that's something I didn't explain. Uh, that's why I left a lot of time for questions then to guide a little bit the, the chat into what interested more for people. And in this case, you need to guide exactly where you want the restoration to be. So, so it's called masking. Or it's also called, in photography, in painting. So I basically mask this area. That has to be done by hand. You can mask more, but you lose the original content. It's a little bit of a trade-off. Uh, it can be done automatically, but I think it's most exact to just mask wherever you want the algorithm to generate something for you, and then the rest will be left untouched. That's why you need to give it con context to work on, because the first attempt will be saying, let me look at the rest, and then let me continue the pattern. But there, there, there need to be a rest to look at. If you have something very small, probably the algorithm will hallucinate something that has nothing to do unless you train very particularly on that painter, um, you need to give it a context. Yes. Hi. Um, yeah, yeah thanks for the chat. Um, can I download the software? <laughs> yeah, Dali is paid. There, I should have put in the resource, uh, a slide with resources, I forgot. Dali, as, it, as always, the first are free, the one, the, the, then later you, you have to pay. But uh, they're, they're free ones, and they're even, that's called stable diffusion. And they're ones that are even embedded in Photoshop, I think, that they, as a plugin. But the good thing about this, and one of the reasons it um, evolved so fast, is because the open source community. So at the beginning, the first one who commercializes this is a company called OpenAI. That, that it, I think it's just open revenue, but it doesn't release the code. So they, pr they made a product out of this. So the product went as far as the engineers and the company wanted. And then someone else replicated the model, the training and, and what I showed you. And then they made it open source. 
And then, and then this is actually fairly, has a lower entry point. You see it's kind of very, to enter this space, it's kind of, um, in, there, there's some intuitive bit. So everyone can contribute, even to a smaller part. And then it grew up. Um, and then you have, that's how you have video and, and audio generated with these techniques of prompting, text prompting, because the community chipped in. So definitely it's free. And, and yeah, it's for everyone that can contribute for sure. Hi, um, I think I'm really interested in knowing just kind of what the reaction's been like if you've spoken to like other art historians or like people that are doing restoration art, because I just imagine this would probably be like a massive thing in being able to restore art. And I'm just interested like whether there's pe like the whether some people are really excited about it. Like, is there any people that are like apprehensive about it, given that it's like AI generated stuff? I'm just interested in knowing what the reactions been. Yeah, yes, I think you have reactions as people. Um, so, for example, my supervisor was like, "Oh, let's make that exhibition VR," and then he said, "No, no, no, augmented reality," and then more and more and more. And then you need to unplug him because then it's like more and more, and then boom. So and then so because you can dream, I think the best for two communities to to work together is to have something to offer without imposing. So I am saying, well, this is a tool that will give you options that are based on some method, and and that we we show it work by by doing these these studies with people. So, so then let me show you the study. I didn't show you the study to convince you that it is real, it does exist. So it is a little bit hard um, to interpret, but basically this is the input for the model. And the prompt, the prompt was something like print gallery Escher, something like that. And the model comes with many options for you, actually. It doesn't generate one. It's not one input, one output. It's one input. I mask this part. So it's like generate something for this. And the model gives you many options. And then we generate an, an art critic that from the thousands of options that the model gives you, you can keep running the model, and it would generate different random, because the model doesn't know. The, the paint is like a painter that doesn't know. And then you have to cherry pick and say, oh, I want this one, for example, or this one. That makes sense. But if it was um, an impressionist artist or, or some crazy artist, probably this would be the one that would fit better. So you need to train. What we did is we train a model that from all the craziness that the generator model gives us, there is a, another model that picks the ones that is best. So there are two models working together. One that generates a lot of crap, but you run it thousands of times. And it doesn't matter, because then you have another one that picks the best one. And when we pick the best one, we ask to people, how much of an Escher connoisseur are you? And then, what's the probability of this one being an Escher? What's the probability of this one being an Escher? And then our selector has given 0% to this one, 0% to this one. This is all the, the, our model selector. And this is the humans evaluating the likeliness of this being an Escher. So what we say is that, look, you don't have to use this, of course, but this is something that you can consider in your palette of options. And yeah, and then nothing stops us to, to then make an exhibition of different possible restorations because dreaming is, is free, right? Yeah, 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 yeah thank you. No, that would, be, that would be nice. I don't think we can have a real, but if you have anything that you want to well, restore, we donate. Yeah. You should export those, sorry. Yeah, you should just export those images that you've got as free objects and use it in, a, in an AR or VR experience. Yeah. yeah that so go to that, I think that would be super interesting to experience those pieces. You know, I suppose you could yes. do any art pieces, but these ones are pretty unique, you know? And you could almost dissect 
that image that you've got there, you could dissect and you could kind of have a, yeah, a journey, like, like kind of you just explained, you know, but you could actually move them out and you could, yeah, interact with that piece. Ah, that yeah, yeah, How, see, see the different possibilities, like yeah. the one that I shown. That's a good idea. Right. Um, it's like choosing your own adventure. Yeah, it's, uh, keep going, yeah. The funny ones. This ones. Yeah. But just, you know, because it is essentially what it is, right? It's five different images all in mm -hmm. within itself. So uh, you can take yeah. it out, you can take Sorry, that can you... out, you can take this bit out. Sorry, I'm, I'm not an MC. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah. Yes. As a, as a VR experience, so that's, a problem with yeah, um, that could be quite interesting, I feel, and a lot more, I mean, it's obviously great looking at it on a PowerPoint, and it's super interesting, but that would be another, another thing. Yeah, when, when we do the GIF, because once you have choose one, then you can do yeah. the GIF. That, we thought about doing that in, the, um, in our website, like having, yeah. having this in our website with different restorations that will give you a different GIF, a, a different this one, as you choose different, because there's, there are restorations that have lower chance, but that doesn't mean they're wrong. It can be your own restoration. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's, yeah. there's lots of possibilities you could do, but you want to yes. have a different element, right? And mm. uh, yeah, you could make your own pastiche of it or collage of it, you know? <laughs> I don't know. Yes. You could make a, hy like a new hybrid of, of that and then add color to it as well, right? And then start playing with the color. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> I think we should move on. <laughs> Don't worry, we have 15 minutes. I'll, I'll uh, be here. No, no 10. 10. Okay. <laughs> yes, please. Oh, thanks so much for the talk. It was yeah. really amazing. I was wondering if you mind going, please, to the, the cubist piece with the burn damage. One yes. Second. I was just wondering if it would be possible to. Um, if you mask the area with the burn damage, there might be, for example, in an image editing tool, an ability to extract the fresh, change the threshold to maybe extract the line data. And then I was wondering whether it'd be possible for the AI to fill in, if you just had the line data to fill in like the color and everything around it. Would that be something that would yeah. be possible to do? Yes, yes, definitely. Yes, this is something that even you can do with Photoshop now, uh, but you can do AI with, with that as well. Like, just say, whatever the RGB combination, the red, green, and blue combination you have here, port it to here. And that's how you change the palette. Um, that would be, yes. So we just wanted, like, minimum, minimum intervention, but you can keep working and generate something that, because here you can still see the burn part, or you can do some post-processing as well. It doesn't have to be everything AI. You can do some post-processing to, to homogenize the color. Yeah. Uh, I think we have two more, yeah. Yeah, I'm curious about the whole question of artistic integrity in all of this. And I wondered whether you'd actually run this work by professional art restorers, number one. And number two, I'm also curious about what had been done with these specific examples before the algorithm came along. Is it the distinction, isn't there? Because this one, for example, was an existing, it was a complete painting which has been marred. Some of the other ones, they're not restorations, they're completions. Yes. And had anybody, just with paint or whatever, or, or had anyone thought to actually complete those paintings? What, where are those results? Yes, yes, I can show you. Like one of the results. Um, so many questions here. I'll answer you the last one. Yeah. Um, this is a previous effort from Leiden University 10 years ago. The, they, they also embarked in the project of completing print gallery. Mm. They, the focus of them was mostly to, to get the rotation right that then we built upon. And this is the, the completion that they came, but it's not a completion, it's a redo, redo their work, because you can see this is the, what they did, and this is, this is Spring Gallery. As you can see, the lines and the man, they had to redo everything from scratch. So our method just works on the part that it's needed. We didn't touch anything else. So before artificial intelligence, um, you basically have, have either 
some tool like Photoshop, or then a human will come and so so basically our assistant comes where it's too difficult or too complicated for a human because it's either too small or too rotated. And then they also apply this, this trick of putting everything straight, but then they blend they couldn't blend in with with Escher's original because it looked if you come and paint here by hand, it looked off. So, so they had to redo everything again, while we only touched the part that, and also they hire a painter. Yeah, so they hire, they hire a painter. Uh, the painter was smart enough to put palm trees uh, in Malta. <laughs> so you see, uh, what we propose here is not only a machine will come, but it will, it's also a process to know, a guided process to have science, some scientific basis. Then, as, a, as for our restorers, I have reached um, people at the University of Bristol, but um, I think I got more interest from communities more familiar with technology. So, for example, from, from the uni, no one really replied, really, to me. And, and, yeah, and, and, and I, got, I got publications out of this, like, scientific peer review publication. So it's not only me saying that, and my friends saying that this is interesting. It's like someone on the, on the scientific community deemed that this was were published. So yeah, hopefully it can reach more people. Yeah, thank you. I think we have one more. Uh, more. Uh, okay. I wanted to sort of follow up on that. that yeah. So the Cezanne piece was deliberately, was unfinished. Cezanne never finished that painting. Whereas ah. the, um, the Escher piece is a finished work. Like Escher yeah. meant for there to be a white blob in the center of that pi picture. E okay. <laughs> so uh, how do you feel about that? Like if Escher came in and saw your work, what would he say? Would he be like, where's my white blob gone? <laughs> yeah. So for example, in, in the book that you read, this uh, Bach, Godel, and Escher, uh, they say that he couldn't finish because he didn't know how to finish. I disagree with that. I think he knew, he just left it for the mystery. Yeah, to, yeah. to be something more mysterious. Um, I contacted the Escher estate, they were not happy. <laughs> <laughs> but here we are. <laughs> um, but I think it's, um, it's an interesting challenge, like me and many other people have work on this piece of work because when you advance art, you advance science. Okay. <laughs> All right, well, I think we might leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Oh, you, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you so much. So before we all go, a quick reminder that there is no talk next week. Um, we'll be back in two weeks' time when the SOMA team will be talking about their work designing inclusive VR experiences. If you do want to stick around and hot desk today or find out more about what we do, or if you want to hang around until 5 p.m., it's first Friday this week. That means that there are drinks, hanging out, networking. There'll be some people showing some work. We've got some people from the Bristol Games Lab. We've got some people from the Africa Eye Festival, which starts today watershed and we our very own Zoe and George will be over there talking about some of the work they're doing to make our building more uh, environmentally sustainable uh, but if you do want to stick around more find out what we do then please come find one of the studio team studio team put your hands in the air well, there's only three of us today uh, I think there are more people around they're just not here right now uh, we will be happy to help if you're watching online uh, please do drop us a line on studio at watershed.co.uk with any questions thank you all for being here today and we will see you again next time.